Hello everybody, it's seven o'clock and we welcome you to a night in Uzbekistan. Um, I am Sheila Desai, I'm your host for this evening and I'm also the owner and founder of EYHO Tours. So um, EYHO stands for Eat Your Heart Out Tours. It's a, it's a name that came about about 10 years ago, 11 years ago when we started this company, <clears throat> which has morphed into more of a textiles and arts and crafts and material cultures uh, tour company. And basically we specialize in small group tours to destinations where you might need a little bit of help navigating the destination you might want to go with an expert. And so this is what we've been doing for the last 10 years. And um, basically, uh, you know, it's been a year since today is the year that the pandemic was declared. And it feels like there is hope in the air. It feels like we're finally over the hump. Certainly travel has been taking off and um, we're looking forward to taking you to Uzbekistan later this year. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping as always, we're gonna start with, uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you how long this uh, tour will last for about, sorry, the stop will last for about over an hour, just over an hour with questions at the end. And um, we are going to use uh, the Q&A function for any questions that you might have, you can use the chat for comments. You can put your uh, questions in the Q&A function. These are, are controls are found at the bottom of your screen. If you can't hear something or you want uh, either me or Dana to repeat something, then please use the raise hand function, again, found at the bottom of your screen. And um, uh, just lastly, a little uh, teaser for next week, we're going to go to Morocco and talk about the fabulous Zalij, which is the, uh, the tile work, the very fine ceramic tile work that you see all over Morocco. It's so fascinating. Uh, so we're gonna talk about Morocco. We're going to also gonna give you a preview of our Morocco tour. So um, let's see now. I'll see if I can share my screen. Green. Let's try again. Okay, here we go. All right, good. So um, great. So here we go. This is what greets you when you go to Uzbekistan, the, the monuments, the blue, the, uh, uh, the gold, and it's, it's just magnificent. It's magnificent beyond words. Uh, and I love taking you back there virtually. I'm hoping to take you there in the fall. Uh, so why why is this region so special? We'll go into that in a little while. But before we do that, I just wanna talk about what we're going to try and accomplish today. Uh, we are going to talk about the Uzbekistan tour, what makes this region so special and uh, why has it been so relevant for so many years, so many millennia really. Uh, we're gonna talk about its highlights. Then I'm going to hand over to Dana Davis, who is the tour leader for Uzbekistan. She's going to talk about the mulberry trees of Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, then we'll talk about the uh, Kyrgyzstan tour at the end, uh, just a few minutes. And again, uh, we'll wrap up with questions at the end. So let's get started. Okay, so um, just a little bit about EYHO tours in case you're not familiar. It's always lovely seeing uh, all the returning people that we've traveled with. So they, they don't need any introduction to the company, but I'll just go over this very quickly. We specialize in small groups. So generally around uh, 12 to 14, no more certainly than uh, 15 or 16. And during the pandemic, much smaller. Uh, there are theme tours, so we always train a lens on the textiles or, or the um, history architecture of a destination to allow you to go deeper. We also have intimate knowledge of our destination. So we're talking several dry runs, trying to figure out and, and iron out everything on the itinerary before we take you there. Um, led by North American and UK tour leaders, this time, particularly, it's very important. We're not going to put our your safety on the line. We are also putting our safety on the line personally. So we're not farming you off with some guide, you know, in in the country there. Uh, 
so uh, having, having said that, we do have the best local partners and very passionate, knowledgeable guides who have uh, stood by us for years. Uh, again, multiple repeat clients. We're TICO accredited and certified. TICO stands for Travel Industry Council of Ontario, which means stringent audits and trust accounting. And uh, to give you ease of mind that your money is safe with us. So that in a nutshell is EYHO tools. Um, okay, so let's jump right into the Silk Route of the, um, uh, you know, the, the pre the 1300s. So, so first of all, this is where Uzbekistan is. It's tucked away right there in the, in the heart of Asia. It's actually a double landlocked country, one of only two double landlocked countries in the world. And uh, in the Middle Ages, before the sea routes to, um, to the east from Europe were discovered, this area was, uh, was basically the, the axis upon which the exchange between uh, Asia and Europe took place. So, and, and the Silk Route was not just one route. It was actually many, many different hundreds of little routes all over the place. Uh, but the main route was the one that avoided the, the desert in, in the north and the highlands in the north and also the Himalayas here. And it, it forced the caravans through what is right now Uzbekistan. Present day Uzbekistan is around here between these two rivers here. And um, it was the pivotal part of the Silk Route. So uh, basically this part became fabulously wealthy, fabulous uh, interchange of uh, invaders, of empires, of religion, ideas. And uh, this is why this, this legacy has continued for millennia. And now we find this fascinating region having just come out from Soviet regime is being building up and it, tourism is opening up and it's like discovering the, the curtain has lifted and it's it, we're discovering this fascinating, fascinating region all over again. <clears throat> so, um, so we'll just, I, I, to talk about why this region is so special, you have to understand a little bit of history and I'm a little bit of a history buff. So uh, bear with me while I give you a quick crash course on the, the history of Uzbekistan dating back to ancient times, which was the sixth century BCE. <clears throat> so Cyrus, the Persian emperor, uh, the Achaemenid emperor empire was here in the sixth century BCE, and he brought Zoroastrianism to this region. Uh, and after that, we had the Alexander, the Hellenic empire was here with Alexander the Great. In fact, he married a Bactrian princess. And, um, and soon after that, um, the um, 200 years later, it was the Kushan Empire from uh, the Northern India that spread Buddhism around this area. And then following that, uh, during the first century CE, there, there was a lot of um, uh, back and forth of Turkic and Mongol invasions from China and Mongolia. There was a flow of Turkic, Afghan and Arab people. And then uh, during the seventh century, we had the Arab and the advent of Islam to this area. Uh, there was uh, conversion to Islam and uh, most of it was forceful. And by the 10th century, the, uh, this area was uh, predominantly Muslim. In fact, it was all Muslim, uh, followed by several different dynasties of, um, of the Samanids and the Karkanids, uh, Ghaznavids and the Seljuks. They were, you know, if you think about Persians, Arabs, Afghans and Turkic peoples, uh, basically it was this, this constant uh, back and forth of power between these, these four groups of uh, people. And uh, we also look at the, um, then we get into the Middle Ages. We are looking at the 11th century uh, building of Kiva, which was Khorezm at that time, it was later known as Kiva. Uh, and in the, um, in the uh, let me just get my dates right here. So 13th century, we had the Mongols, the arrival of the Mongols through Genghis Khan, uh, is charming Genghis Khan here with, uh, he, he raised uh, Samarkand and Bukhara and uh, basically conquered 
by force, um, but, but spread his, uh, his legacy far and wide. So Genghis Khan was here in the, uh, in the 13th century. They were turfed out in the 14th century by the Timurids, basically descendants of uh, Timur Lane. And this is when the, the, architectural, the, the architecture that we're gonna see came about during the Timurids during the 14th century, the, the very glorious blue tiled architecture uh, that the Timurids favored. Um, and this is also a period when the arts, crafts, literature, astronomy flourished in Uzbekistan. We had, uh, we had several, uh, following that there were several dynasties of the Shabanids. And of course, at that time, there was also the, uh, the sea route had been discovered to the east. So uh, it didn't quite mean that Uzbekistan kind of fell out of uh, uh, the, uh, the the you know importance because uh, what happened in the in the seventeenth century we had the great game when the imperial powers began coming to this region and and uh, vying with each other for control of this region and you can see here uh, you know these emirs and the khans of Bukhara and Kiva, uh, they are entertaining the imperialists, but uh, they knew exactly what was going on. They were not fools. And Bukhara was actually the, the center for a, a few beheadings of imperialists at this point. Um, and then fast track into the Russian empire, the, they brought Christianity to this region. And then in 1917, the Soviet power rose, they brought a lot of, um, they tried to combat illiteracy, they brought the cotton, uh, but they also destroyed traditional lifestyle arts, crafts through their industrialization and uh, Stalin's political repression. Uh, during the, the Second World War, the, um, the Russian, the, the Soviets used Tashkent as an evacuation center. So this, this is where a lot of the refugees from the uh, Soviet areas, the, from what was, you know, what is now Russia, they were sent to this area. And Dina, I know, is going to talk about one uh, group of these refugees that stayed here, the Koreans. So, um, uh, so Tashkent was known as the city of bread and the city of friendship. And even today, it's a very, very friendly city. Um, Uzbekistan was uh, is newly independent, recently newly, relatively recently in, in independent since 1991, and um, has been on a track to democratize with market economy, and uh, it has alliance with uh, China on the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, which is a reimagining of the ancient Silk Route. Uh, and uh, this is again, it's coming back into pro prominence because of this. So um, let's move on. So what does this, what has this meant? The, this crash course in history uh, tells you why there is this astonishing ethnic and cultural diversity. So um, you have the Tajik people who are who dominate in the Tajikist, uh, sorry, in, in the in Samarkand and Bukhara area. They're of Persian descent, but you also have the north is mostly Turkic, and you have the west is Afghan. Mixed in is is Russians who've stayed back. Uh, you just have to stand in Chorsu Bazaar, which is where some of these uh, photographs are from. Uh, and you'll see it'll it'll be like a United Nations of uh, of Asia, really. So you'll see the Uzbeks and the Tajiks and the Kyrgyz and the Kazakhs and the Afghans. You see ethnic Russians, Poles, U Uyghurs, Chinese, Koreans. It really is a melting pot. Uh, that that term is overused today, but it, in Uzbekistan, you really do get that sense of of a melting pot. Uh, so, um, and, and, and this has also given rise to the extraordinary textiles and arts and crafts uh, legacy of this region because it was A, very wealthy, and B, it had this, this back and flow ebb of, of different people bringing all kinds of skills from their home areas. So it has become an amalgamation of uh, extraordinary arts and crafts. So, where are we going on this tour? I'll talk about that a little bit. So we start in Tashkent, that's going to be our base. And we always are in a, in a central place in Tashkent. It's very walkable, it's a safe city. So from Tashkent, we head 
uh, via train, we go into Fer Fergana Valley and each of these destinations I'm gonna talk about later. Uh, from Fergana Valley, we, we take cars and we drive through these beautiful mountain passes back again to Tashkent. From Tashkent, we fly to Nukas, uh, which is out uh, far west in the semi-desert area of Karakal, Pakistan. From Nukas, we will drive through, um, through the most ancient part of uh, Uzbekistan to, uh, to get to Kiba. And then from Kiva to Bukhara, we go by train, by bullet train, actually very exciting. Um, and from Bukhara, we are going to drive to Samarkand. We have a day trip to Shakrasab and then back to Tashkent. Um, and if you're joining us for, for Kyrgyzstan, I'll talk about that. But basically, you know, uh, you'll be going to Kyrgyzstan before you come to Uzbekistan and you fly into Bishkek. And then from there, there's a connection to Tashkent. So it's all very doable. Um, okay, so this is roughly the itinerary. Um, I'll be referring back to this as we move along. Uh, basically, let's see now. So Tashkent, uh, this is going to be our base in, in uh, Uzbekistan. Tashkent is a fascinating, fascinating city. I must say that um, it took me by complete surprise. I thought it would be this kind of, uh, you know, backwaters, but it's it's cosmopolitan, it's uh, beautifully planned, it's a beautiful city. The architecture is, is beautiful from the Russian times and also some of it dubious architecture from the Soviet era. Uh, but it's all, it's a fascinating blend. And, and the, the best thing that I like about Tashkent is their subway system, which is the first in the whole of uh, Central Asia. Uh, and uh, this subway system was built in uh, following the 1966 earthquake. It was opened in 1977. Really, the thing about this subway is I've never seen anything so beautiful in underground. Uh, it, it is like little palaces. Each one of these stations is like a little palace with domes and 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 um, ceramic and tile work and and marble. And it's just it's it's just gorgeous. It's just a beautiful, beautiful. Each station is different. So there is one station that's dedicated to the cosmonaut um, uh, Navoy, and then there is one station that's dedicated just to the legacy of cotton, for example. And this is all uh, fascinating just to get a tour of Uzbekistan in Tashkent through the subway system. You could spend the whole day just traveling from one station to another. Um, and then, of course, you have the, um, the, the Soviet era prefabs and, and this, uh, this uh, uh, much loved, I'd say, you know, it's, it's dubious, the architecture, obviously, but uh, at night they light this up and they would have shows, you know, they project through laser beams, they project uh, all kinds of images and whatever it is, you know, on, on this building here. And also Tashkent is, um, it has some beautiful restored um, in the old part, I wouldn't say restored, they rebuilt really the madrasas and the medinas, uh, the exquisite woodwork, exquisite painting and architectural details. So it's, it's a fascinating blend of, uh, of Soviet, Russian, uh, modern day and ancient, like a recreation. Lots and lots to do in Tashkent. So that is Tashkent. Uh, next, we go to Fergana Valley, which uh, you remember, we'll, we're going to take the train all the way down into this corner, right tucked away at the south east corner of Uzbekistan. Um, and the reason why we go there, Fergana Valley, is, uh, is where, because of the two mountain passes on the north and the south, the, this is where, you know, a lot of the trade was channeled. And this area became very famous and very uh, known for its horses. This is where the horses came from. And also this, is, this area became known for its arts and crafts. Um, very fine woodworking, of course, the ikats, which uh, Dana is going to talk about. And um, uh, some of the best um, meals I've had are in Fergana Valley. It's beautiful, beautiful area. So we go to Fergana Valley. And then uh, we fly, we drive back through some beautiful mountain roads, which are actually are amazing infrastructure uh, through to, to Tashkent. And then we take a flight to Nukas. Now, uh, not many people actually get to Nukas because it is, it is difficult to get to. Uh, we make it a point. Uh, Dana has insisted that we go to Nukas and I'm so glad she did because it really was the highlight of 
uh, this trip. And there were so many highlights. So to say that it was the highlight, uh, you know, it must be very special. And it was, it, it did not disappoint. It was, it is the, um, basically it's the collection of Igor Savitsky. He was, um, uh, during the Soviet times, he was, um, he had uh, basically, he uh, spirited away something like 10,000 pieces of uh, Soviet era avant-garde art. And um, he kept it from the Soviet authorities at the risk of his life. He would have been murdered or sent off to the gulags, but he kept this uh, hidden. And that's the reason why he chose this place because it's so remote. Uh, and he basically, uh, after, after independence, uh, Uzbekistan built this museum out there. It's in the middle of nowhere, really. It's, in the, it's close to the Aral Sea. Uh, which is, you might know that it's an uh, environmental disaster. Tourism happens there because the Soviets drain that area to, to provide water for um, the cotton plantations. Uh, so really, it's, it's a bit of a desolate area. I think it's beautiful in its own right. But really, the reason why we go there is to see this spectacular art collection. Amazing. We just could not believe our eyes that we were actually... Um, you know, in, in the Louvre of the East, uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars of art that is that is contained in this tiny museum. So we go to Nukas, and then from Nukas we drive through this area. As I said, it's semi-desert, and uh, this is some some of the oldest uh, architecture that we'll find or monuments that we'll find in, in Uzbekistan. They're from the sixth century BCE. Uh, the the uh, from Cyrus uh, the emperor time and uh, Cyrus the Great's time uh, and this very uh, special part I thought these monuments have not been restored this is a UNESCO site and uh, we, we we climb up there so there's actually three different uh, forts like this and we climb up into these forts and uh, we were the only ones uh, when we been there, you get this feeling of a deep, deep connection to history. Uh, we're going back, you know, like millennia uh, and looking over these planes and imagining what the armies must have seen or what their, um, you know, how they would have planned their, their strategies and so on. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful flower part, it really connects you to that spirit of Uzbekistan, how, how ancient it is. Um, and then from there, we go straight into Kiva. So we drive to Kiva. And when you get to Kiva, it's a, it's, it's a sense. It's a, it's a sensory delight. So it's a treat for the eyes. The blue uh, comes at you. Um, the, the, the music, the life, the, uh, it's very exuberant down in a very refined sort of way. So, you know, there's always weddings happening. There's always music on the streets and, and there's, you know, performers out there. It's lovely walkable, you know, again, it's another UNESCO World Heritage Site, H and Kala. Um, and um, we, we would stay there a couple of nights in Kiva. Uh, and I have to tell you about this, my, my most the favorite of all uh, monuments in Kiva is this mosque, it's called, it's not a monument, it's a, it's a functioning mosque actually, and it's called the Friday Prayer Mosque, the Friday Mosque, uh, and what makes it so special is that it's, it, it was built in the, um, let me just check this, it was built in first built in the 11th century and then destroyed. Uh, this mosque is not like your typical mosque because it doesn't have a dome, it doesn't have any portals, but it does have 200 individually hand-carved uh, pillars, wooden pillars that uh, date back, some of them date back to the 14th century. And when it was destroyed, a lot of these pillars disappeared. The, the local people took them for building material. And then when they rebuilt it, the, the Emir of, Bukha, of Kiva, uh, when he built it, rebuilt it, he um, petitioned the people to bring back their, the pillars and they did. And they've reconstructed this mosque on the site of the original mosque. It's a very special place again, direct, almost like direct connection to that, that sense of history. Um, so from Kiva, we go to Bukhara. Again, this is a, each one of these cities has their own charm and their own um, <clears throat> personality. <clears throat> so where Kiva was the sensory delight, uh, Bukhara, I, 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 I think of as the beating heart of commerce or the Silk Road. 
Um, so what they had in Bukhara, which was 11th century, it was rebuilt in the 16th century, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and um, basically they had 14 trading domes. So each one of these trading domes were, uh, were specialized in the trading of, it could be something as special as rare books or, or, or you know, like fine jewelry or, or uh, diamonds or, you know. Um, and, and then uh, now there's only four of these trading domes left. They're being restored. Uh, and inside is like a catacomb of little shops and bazaars. Uh, very, very fascinating to, to wander down these. So this is Bukhara. Uh, we this are obviously all the monuments you can see here at the back here. Um, so we, you know, madrasas, monuments. Again, lots of lots of crafts, arts and crafts. Uh, and uh, this very august personality is the last emir of Bukhara. He was Alim Khan, who also uh, was the last emir before he was deposed by the Soviets. Uh, and during his grandfather's time, they built what they call the White Palace. It was a, a combination of, uh, of, of uh, Russian style, here you can see that, uh, with um, with a, a more like a, a you know Central Asian style of architecture, uh, this palace was built to welcome the Tsar. Uh, unfortunately, he never came, but uh, the last Emir used it to house his harem here. Uh, it also has the most fabulous textile museum with the most amazing Suzani's I've seen. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, these long ikat coats and, you know, the, the way they used to dress in, in that time. So it's a beautiful, beautiful textile museum. Uh, of course, I had to stick in this photograph of the bullet train. I'm so thrilled to go on a bullet train and get to um, Sabrakan in less than an hour. Okay, so Samarkand. Samarkand uh, was founded in the 8th century BCE. It was destroyed several times. Um, and really, it is the jewel of the Silk Road uh, cities. Uh, the name Samarkand evokes just mystery and, and uh, the fabulousness of the, of the monuments. Uh, and you won't be disappointed. This is where Timur was buried. He actually wanted to be buried in his birthplace of Shakrasabs, but he couldn't make it back. He died during the winter. And so they had to build him a very hurriedly built tomb. I, I don't think it was hurried. I mean, there's nothing hurried about it because it, it's been restored. And um, it was, it was, it's just spectacular. This is just the ceiling, the domed ceiling. When you look up and you see this fabulous, fabulous mosaic res restoration. Um, and um, and here, this is Registan Square with all the weddings. The people come there, the wedding couples come there to get blessed by the sense, uh, by the saints. They believe that, you know, the, the power of uh, the, the legacy of the, uh, the, the great uh, conquerors and so on can, will bless them in this day. Uh, so that's the famous Registan Square. Uh, like, okay, so the one thing that Samarkand sometimes uh, feels a little bit of criticism is that the monuments have been overzealously restored. Uh, and here I've got a couple of photographs to show what these monuments looked like at one stage. Uh, you know, they were crumbling, falling apart, and they have been restored. This is the Bibi Khanum Mosque that has been restored to absolute glory. And really, I think without the restoration, we'd have lost these monuments. So, um, you know, it's 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 a debatable point. Uh, when you go back there, you can really imagine the, the glory of, of Samarkand. We're also going to go to Shai Zinda, which is the necropolis for all the Timurid um, dynasty. And it's absolutely spectacular. So that is Samarkand. Um, and from Samarkand, we will go to Shakrasabs, which is where Timur was born. This uh, is 2,700 years old. This city, uh, this palace that he built there, Timur built there, uh, it's called the Aksarai Palace. And um, by th I think by, by this time, maybe the Uzbek government realized that to restore something uh, so that it, it loses its sense of um, history or, or it loses its, its uh, visual sense of history anyway. Uh, so they, they kind of went a little easier on the outward restoration. The structure has been um, strengthened, but just to show you basically, this is what it would 
then. This is what it looks like. So it's already so tall, but it was twice the height uh, when it was still standing. And this entire area was a palace complex. So uh, as Timur said, he said that to see our power, look at my buildings. He said, just look at, see what we are building. And he was the, he was probably the most um, invested in, in the architecture, in, in building the areas uh, around here, around Samarkand and Sakrasabh. So we're gonna see all that. Um, okay, so when you go to Uzbekistan, what shouldn't you miss and what do we, put in this tool to make sure that you not only get all these monuments, but you get a sense of this, uh, this land uh, of color and uh, food and, and, you know, basically we go to the markets to see where the locals shop and live. Uh, you can go and buy all the dried fruits and nuts to your heart's content. You can see there is just so much color and, and the fabrics and the textiles. The, this is a market in Urgut. Um, you can buy your ikats by the yard. Uh, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, we, we time it so that we're, we're at these local markets. There are certain days of the week that these local markets take place. And we time it so that we get there and we can have uh, at least a half a day at these markets. So they're very special, the local markets. Um, and of course, you cannot go to Uzbekistan, particularly during the fall, which is just out, uh, after the harvest time, and not enjoy the food. The food is a treat. Fresh bread baked in these tandoors, they call it tandirs there, they call these naan. And it's always, every meal is accompanied by fresh bread. We also have the culinary workshop. Uh, we have a plov here, which is the national dish. It's a rice and meat dish with quail eggs. Uh, very tasty, I'm told. I'm vegetarian, so I didn't try it, but I had a lot of the wonderful dill soup and the salad. So it's, uh, it was a treat. The, the food was absolutely amazing. Um, of course, we're going to visit lots of artisans. We are going to see uh, pottery in its various forms. This is uh, this lovely person. He practices pottery from uh, generations old. He hasn't changed the way he practices pottery. Uh, and we're going to see some very contemporary forms of pottery as well. Uh, very traditional green glaze, as you see, that's, uh, that's known, that this area is known for. Uh, we're, we'll visit, of course, we're going to go and see the, how the silk is, is woven. It's a huge sericulture here in this area, um, preparing it for ikat for the dyeing, uh, and we're going to see lots of Suzani, we're going to see paper, but I'm going to let Dana talk about that. I don't want to steal her thunder on this one. Um, and then of course, you don't go to Uzbekistan and not run into a wedding, particularly during the time that we go. Uh, people love partying on the streets, they love singing, dancing, you're bound to run into a, a, a few weddings. They'll invite you to join them, they'll invite you even in going to the restaurants, they'll have their wedding parties there, <clears throat> and they will um, they will try and include you in, in their celebration. So it's it's just a just a wonderful, wonderful, friendly. Uh, fascinating, historically rich uh, textiles. It's got everything really. So uh, that's Uz Uzbekistan. Okay, so I'm going to stop uh, talking now and I'm going to hand over to Dana uh, and she's going to talk about the mulberry trees which are so, um, so special in this area. Okay, hi Dana.